As Christians, we hold to a worldview that's just as viable as anybody else's in this day and age. If you think about it, what someone believes either in God or not in God at all, their argument is just as viable to them as mine is to me. Truth is on the battlefield today. It doesn't matter what you're representing. You're representing your side of the truth, your understanding of truth. We as Christians make a big claim. I have to admit, we make the claim that in the beginning, God. Is there evidence for that? We make the claim that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Well, we all have a worldview. And again, it's all based upon, at least it should be, on truth. When we put forth an argument, it is assumed that we can back it up. You can't go into the court of law and make a statement without having evidence. You've got to bring forth the truth. Now, when we talk about the existence of God or there not being a God, someone's got to bring forth some form of evidence and or uh, a pattern of logic that can back up their claim. It's a, it's a huge statement. It's a tremendous thing to say. Yeah, I think that the culture um, has a requirement of evidence more and more. I mean, this is what the nature of our students when they go to university, the kinds of claims they're going to get from professors. That side is always going to say that they hold a position that they can support evidentially. Of course, the question is, do we as Christians hold a position that we can make a case for evidentially? Well, I think part of the problem you have is that the, that the people we're talking to really have no understanding of what evidence would be appropriate to make a case to begin with. I'm not really too surprised at the direction that we're moving in in our society right now. I am a little bit shocked by the pace and it really shows that we are in an emergency situation where we've got to wake up and the church has got to stop being a place where we teach people to feel good about themselves, where we, we teach practical tidbits of advice for daily living and self-help and self-improvement. We absolutely have to get, get down to worldview because we're about to bottom out in our society. We're, we're just, it's just that the pace is moving so rapidly in the direction of secularism that uh, uh, things are gonna implode at some point and the church has gotta be there to pick up the mess. The reason our country is where it is now is because of the church. It's the church that's got, gotten anti-intellectual and it's been anti-intellectual since about the turn of the century 1900s or so, when instead of engaging the culture, we decided that those things were dirty, those things were corrupt, we couldn't get involved, we couldn't get our hands dirty, we had to be separate. And when you separate from the culture, when the godly people get out of the culture, then the culture goes godless. We've given up entertainment, we've given up law, we've given up politics, we've given up the media, we've given up the educational institutions to the seculars. It's no wonder they've become secular. It's our fault. So the big question is, is there weight, is there magnitude behind your claim? And you've got to be thinking for a moment, because on both ends of the spectrum, there is the believer in God, and then there's the atheist. Have you ever stopped to think this? Both camps host some very bright people, very smart people. I am not denying the intelligence level on either side. What I'm asking you to think about is, uh, apparently, it is not an intellectual issue, is it? Because guys on both sides of the camp have great arguments. It comes down to the truth, what backs up the truth. And here's the thing that I want you to consider. The truth that you hold forth to stand with and stand behind, what does it do for your life? What does it do regarding all aspects of your life? Because if it is an all-encompassing truth, as truth should be, is it powerful enough to take you, as it were, from cradle to grave? The truth that you hold is it something that is beyond just intellectualism? Is it intellectually honest? Is it something that answers your moral issue? Is it something that answers this area that we talk about, the spirituality of man? How big is your truth? What qualifies as evidence in the first place? And if you look at the rare nature, say, of murders in the state of California, given the population in California, murder is actually quite rare in California. And there are certain kinds of murders that are even rare. I recently had a case where a woman was killed with a garrote. That is such a rare event in the entire nation that I had a hard time finding similar cases anywhere in the nation that to my own case I was working. Now the question becomes, how am I going to make a case against this suspect in this extraordinarily rare event 
Do I need extraordinary evidence to prove this extraordinary claim? Of course not. We're going to use the same kind of relatively pedestrian evidence we use to make any other kind of case. So as it turns out, we do make cases all the time for extraordinary claims using what people would probably think is pretty pedestrian evidence. This is the nature of every criminal trial we work. These are rare events, yet we make the case over a period of weeks using what is, really comes down to two forms of evidence, direct evidence and indirect evidence. It turns out we have both direct evidence and indirect evidence to support our claims as Christians. The very same kinds of pieces of evidence we would use to make other kinds of criminal trials. So when someone tells me we can't make a case for what we believe as a Christian, it's probably because they don't understand how we make cases, number one, or what qualifies as evidence to begin with. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Christians don't get brownie points for being stupid. Paul says, to destroy arguments against the Christian faith and take every thought captive to Christ. Of course, Paul also in Romans chapter 12 says, renew your mind. Why is he telling everybody to renew their minds? Because they need to be renewed. Because our minds, first of all, are bent towards sin, we're depraved, and secondly, when we have all this input from the culture that isn't countered by truth, then we're, we're even in more of a need to have our minds renewed. So this is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. You have to actively go out there and renew your mind and to get answers and to know why you believe what you believe and to love God. It's funny now that I'm a free speech advocate that the very first semester that I came in in the fall of 1993, uh, we had a, a, a evangelical Christian secretary and she played Christian music in the office. And I used to walk in and tell her to turn the music off. Under no circumstances was there to be Christian music playing when I was in the office. And I look back to those days and I know nothing was intellectual, not even my view on separation of church and state. That's a twisted view of the establishment clause, the idea that no government worker can ever listen to Christian music with an earshot of an atheist. What, can you not wear a cross? I mean, it was just absurd. Nothing was really thought through at all. And I can tell you, during that period in my life, it was all behaviorally driven. You just can't have a judge there. You're behaving in a certain way and living in a certain way. And you've got to get, I mean, you've got to get God out of the way and have a huge distance between you and Him. And that's exactly what's driving it. There's nothing intellectual about it. There's nothing even really rational about it. It is all emotive. The truth of the matter is, the truth is under attack inside the church because people are not studying the claims of God. They're not taking God to the test. Does anything in life, anything in history, anything in science, archaeology, anything in geology argue for the existence of God? On the outside of the church, you have an age that is sweeping the globe where I would say that they're the deniers of God. They don't have a a good answer in my opinion, but God cannot exist. So they offer up alternative responses to our existence. What I'm saying is, I believe in the Judeo-Christian Bible answer. In the beginning, God, and in the book of Revelation, God returns. It is the God who created. Is there evidence for it? Is there logic to the design that we see? I'm not trying to convince you either way. I just want you to think, because quite frankly, I believe that if you think honestly, I believe that you'll have to entertain the existence of a divine engineer, a divine creator, someone who's outside of what you and I can experience solely on our plane of existence. Well, so what it really comes down to is uh, there's a difference between whether or not we have evidence or whether or not we're able to articulate the evidence. So it's two different things really, right? So it'd be one thing to say, well, I can't articulate the evidence because there really isn't any evidence I could articulate. That would be one kind of problem, but that's not our situation. Now it turns out we're in a particular major sport playoff season right now, but we're always in some sports playoff season. And I'll bet you that people who are watching this, many of us can make a really strong case for why we believe our team should be able to make it through the playoffs. In other words, we are able to articulate a case for any number of meaningless things in life. Yet when it comes down to the, the truth about Christianity, we haven't even begun to study this stuff. So it really is a matter of where we're going to apply our attention. What I see is that we have a, a, a very large, passionate set of believers who, if I'm honest with you, are in many ways accidentally Christian. They happen to be in the right place. 
They believe the right things, but they don't know why this is the right place and why this is evidentially true. So as it turns out, what we have to do is just animate the sleeping giant. We've got this large group that really could make an impact on culture, but it would have to spend the same amount of time it's presently spending driving our kids back and forth to volleyball tournaments. I mean, we, we, we invest our time, money, and energy and stuff. The question is, are we investing our time, money, and energy into kingdom building? And that's probably what we're not doing. So it's not a matter of, well, we've got a weak case, now we're just stuck with it. It's a matter of we don't know how to articulate the strong case we have. I, I think we can't back away from using the term cowardice. It, it's really amazing. You know, I, as a person who fights for free speech rights on college campuses, I am absolutely shocked at how tenured professors will come up to me and say, gosh, you know, Mike, you're doing a great job standing up for constitutional principles, but, you know, uh, I'd like to join you in your fight, but I really can't do that because I've, I've got kids that I'm putting through college or, you know, I got a mortgage to pay off or they always have excuses, but you know something? They've got tenure. They can't be fired for simply expressing their views and just imagine, you know, what if all of them stood up and basically used their tenure and spoke about the truth. There's no possible way that they could target us. I would draw an analogy with Christians. We've got tenure. Okay, we, we, we've got eternity on our side. We know what the answer is in the final analysis. Given that security that we have, how could we possibly retreat in the court of public opinion and allow the secularist to define the cultural wars and to absolutely control the narrative. It's shocking. So at the heart of it, I think it's a faith crisis and an intellectual crisis all rolled into one. Well, it's sort of the objection we've heard before what's the greatest problem in America today is it ignorance and or apathy and one student said I don't know and I don't care right I mean if people are ignorant I'm not saying they're stupid there's a difference between stupidity and ignorance ignorance means you you just don't know the information but you could if you tried and apathy is well look I just I just don't care pretty soon you're gonna be made to care and it's happening to some people already florists caterers uh, people who are involved in the wedding industry, they are being made to care because their very profession is being threatened by so-called gay activism to the point now where they have to participate in, say, same-sex marriage ceremonies or they're going to lose their livelihood. So people are being made to care, and it should never have come to this if Christians had been more active. Hey, do I believe that the church in many aspects and in many ways have in some capacity surrendered? That's a terrible thing to say as a pastor. Yeah, I do. I think the church has surrendered the truth uh, because of laziness, maybe lack of study. Uh, look, it's a discipline to learn. It's a discipline to learn how to argue what you believe in. And I think we've given up on that. I think we've come into this realm of easy believism, easy discipleshipism. And I think one great Puritan once said that as pastors, we have given ourselves to creating sermonettes for Christianettes. And that's not going to accomplish anything. We are to be, as it were, warriors wrapped in truth. We are to stop being polite, not rude, stop being polite and get into the culture and be winsome warriors for the truth. We need to get back to the campus, back to the workplace, back to our neighborhood and lovingly challenge people. Speak the word in truth, but by all means, speak the truth. And if we do that, people, I believe, are going to have to sit up and take notice because, listen, Everyone's having somebody born into their lives. Everyone's having someone die. People have questions. The Christian, based upon the Bible, has the answers. Well, you know, it's just the consequence of living in a broken world. I mean, it's odd that we can sit here and, and look upon creation and know in our heart of hearts that there has to be a creator. I mean, that thing is there. But what's that thing tugging in the opposite direction? It's just brokenness. It's just the fact that we live in a broken world. And you know what that really stresses is the need for, for Christian community. 
I mean, we're called in this life to do two things. You know, one of those is just to glorify God, you know, just marvel in His creation and to worship Him and, and to love Him with all of our hearts and all of our minds. And then the other thing, of course, is that fellowship component is to, to do things for other people, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And those two things can't be separated from one another. To the extent that we commit ourselves to the second thing, it really reinforces the first thing. And it, it's really only through, through Christian community that we can overcome this faith crisis, basically, and restore the intellectual underpinning, uh, underpinnings of the church, which are crumbling right now. I believe personally that a, a human by creation, granted, I'm biased, I believe God created us. The Bible also says that God created us in His image, moral likeness. I believe, based upon the Bible, Romans chapter 1, that there is a natural, God-planted desire for man. I believe that a child easily, naturally will believe in the existence of God. It's interesting to me that as we grow up, we unlearn the concept of God in our lives. We've got to wash God away. We've got to do that intentionally. We've got to get some sort of other explanation Think about that for a moment. People are very passionate about finding some other explanation for God's existence. I would ask you the question, why? Why do you believe that's necessary? Why are you so committed to that? Why is it so advantageous for you to disprove the existence of God and to argue for that everything is an accident? Why? I think that's telling. If I said to you that uh, God came to me last week and gave me a message for you, you could challenge it. You could say, I don't think he spoke to you, Jim. And I said, oh, no, 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 I had this experience. I'm telling you, it was as real as any experience I've ever had. And I, I think you could fairly challenge that. But if I told you God came to me last week in the form of a human and had lunch in my backyard with two of my friends and gave me something to tell you, and after we had lunch, he helped me dig my irrigation line for my yard, and then he built a tree house for my kids, that's a different kind of claim. That's not a vision. That's actually an historical event that occurred in history in my backyard. You could interview my friends. You could look and see if that ditch is still there. You could, you could look at the treehouse and see how, it, you know, how fancy it is. So this is a different kind of claim. Christianity is not the first kind of claim. Christianity is the second kind of claim. You can't falsify or verify the first kind of claim. Either you don't trust I had the vision or you don't trust I had the vision. So we need to stop behaving as though Christianity is the first kind of claim when in fact it's the second. And so when, we ask, when people ask us, why are you a Christian? We need to move beyond our personal experience because everyone has a person. I've got six brothers and sisters all raised LDS, okay? My dad's still an atheist, but my stepmother is, is Mormon. And if you ask them why they are Mormons, they'll give you the same kinds of answers that most of our Christian brothers and sisters will give us as to why they're Christians. They've had an experience. And they think that experience is from God. Well, okay, everyone's had that experience, regardless of what they believe. The question is, can you make a case for the reliability of the Book of Mormon? Can you make a case for the reliability of the Gospels? That's the difference. We could make a case, and that would separate us from every other group. And that's why I think we have to make a change, hopefully 10 years from now. And remember, we're in an Internet age. We're in the first age in which time is being compressed. You know, the Iron Age, the Industrial Age. This had no effect on the compression of time. But the information age means that that lie can get around the globe faster than it used to take, you know, uh, a lot longer for that lie to get around the globe. It happens now in a heartbeat. We do need to start moving because that side is moving at a breakneck pace. Hey, the amazing thing is this, the Bible says, let's assume for a moment you don't believe the Bible. But the Bible says in black and white print that in the last days of human history, people are not going to endure sound doctrine. That means they're exposed to it, but they're going to give up on it. The Bible warns about that. I just have this question, is that happening today? The Bible also says that in the last days, among a religious setting, among those that call themselves believers, that there would be pastors, teachers, evangelists, personalities, who would actually tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. In fact, the Bible puts it this way. Paul spoke to Timothy and said that right before the end, people will gather to themselves teachers who tickle their itching ears. Isn't that kind of a perverse, kind of creepy picture? 
that there's going to be a gathering where people want to be told whatever they want. Don't tell me the truth. And they are going to assemble to themselves teachers that will give them exactly what they want. I just ask you this. Is that happening? Jesus said that in the last days before time ends and he returns, there's going to be false prophets, false teachers, false doctrines, and by doing so will lead many astray. Is that happening? So as I put these things in front of you to consider, you may not believe in the Bible. You may not believe in the existence of God. You may not believe in Jesus Christ. But the things that the Bible says are in fact true and they are coming to pass. What do you say to that? As cops, we, we see the culture in stark contrast, right? There's sheep and there's wolves. And that's the way we see everything, right? We're trying to figure out you know, where the wolves are to protect the sheep. Because there's another dog in the yard. There's another animal in the yard. That's a sheep dog. And that sheep dog is protecting the sheep from the wolves. And all the sheep dog ministries in the United States are all law enforcement, first responder kind of ministries for that reason. Now, Jesus calls us sheep. We're, we're often called by that name, and I think that's not really a compliment to us. That's really a, a, a description of, of folks that are, you know, to be honest, sheep are dumb as a rock, right? They're not the smartest animal in the yard, and they're dirty and smelly and all the other problems that sheep have. But if we had nothing but sheep dogs in the yard, we wouldn't have a wolf problem. We have a wolf problem because we have all kinds of sheep, not enough sheep dogs. So all of us could become the sheep dog. We could make that transition from sheep to sheep dog. And it's just a matter of whether we're willing to do it. And so what I often say is we don't need another million dollar apologist in the church. We need a million one dollar apologist because that's what it's going to take. Well, my point is, is that even if it looks hopeless, that's irrelevant. What you do is you do what's right and leave the results to God. It's not your job or your ability necessarily to win political battles. It's your job to be faithful and leave the results to God. The journey is the destination. You may not win any political battle. That's irrelevant. Your job is to do what's right and leave the results to God. And when you do that, you become more like Jesus. And that's the point. You're supposed to become more like him. You will take persecution. You will take suffering because you're doing the right thing. So just charge straight forward ahead in love, but with determination. Charge straight forward ahead and leave the results to God. Even if people say, oh, that... That cultural issue is done. We just got to move on. No, you just keep doing what's right and you leave the results to God and you will become better for it. Others will become better for it. Hopefully the nation will become better for it. The church will become better for it. And even if it doesn't, you just keep doing what's right. Just speak up. Just speak up and take risks. Uh, so many people are afraid of losing their jobs. And, you know, I, I simply would have to go back to those professors that I work with. You know, I'm the only one. There are 500 professors on my campus, and I'm the only one who speaks out. I'm the only one who gives speeches on college campuses criticizing the university and, and, its, and its phony diversity policies. And, you know, you would think it's absolute professional suicide. What has it done for me? I travel around the country. I meet people. It's, it's created such a more rich and fulfilling life. And I feel like these professors who know the right thing and won't do it and are going to continue publishing in academic journals that 12 people read for the rest of their life. I would say if I were on my deathbed, you don't know what you're missing. Even if you don't see a final victory, there's something intrinsically rewarding about standing up for the truth. There's just something energizing about that. I mean, even if I weren't traveling all around the country and having a chance to go to great churches like this and beautiful places like this and be on the television and on the radio and, and do the wonderful things I've had to do, there's just something invigorating about being able to wake up in the morning excited about taking a stand for something that's meaningful. So I would plead with them by saying through, through passivity, you don't understand what you're missing. That would be my final plea. And I, and I say it from the bottom of my heart. Uh, there was a chance very early on, I was involved in a free speech controversy, and someone came after me for expressing my constitutionally protected opinion on something. There was this little moment in the middle of the conflict where I almost apologized. And I look back on that now about 15 years later, and I think, what if I did? And what if my case, which I ended up pursuing, 
didn't hit the national news and none of this other stuff would have happened. And so I'm thankful and I would, my last plea for people would be to say that there will be a few crisis points in your life where the chips are down and you've got a choice between standing up for truth and, and not doing so and cowering and turning away. Those little decisions, one or two or three little decisions in your life will define the rest of your existence. Don't miss the opportunity by not charging down the mountainside. Um, you know, sometimes I think we look at this idea of do we, how much do we need to know about what we believe as Christians and how much do we need to be able to make the case for what we believe as Christians. And it's, it seems like it's optional for a lot of people who are in the church. But if you think about what Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says that some of you are pastors, some of you are evangelists, some of you are teachers, which means that some of us aren't. And then Paul kind of seems to give us the liberty to know that, hey, some of you are going to be gifted evangelists and some of you aren't. Now, we all feel the burden of evangelism as, as Christians. But Paul really is there saying, well, some of you aren't going to be very good at this. And I guess it's okay that some of us aren't going to be good at this. But Peter doesn't give us that option in 1 Peter 3, right? He says, all of you need to be able to make the case to give the reason for the hope you have in Jesus. He, doesn't, he could easily say what Paul said. Some of you will be able to make the case and some of you won't. That's not what he says. He says, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, well, then you are by definition a Christian case maker. What we do is we take the Christian part and we abbreviate the case maker part. So we're, we're Christians, but we're not Christian case makers. And that's where I think we drop the ball. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, if this isn't true, then it's of no importance. If it is true, though, it's of ultimate importance, critical importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And that's really where we are right now. We have to decide, are you in or are you out? Because if you're in, you have to be a Christian case maker. That's really the only kind of Christian that Peter gives you an option to be. And so if you're not going to do that, then what? Does, please stop calling yourself a Christian. If you're going to embrace reality, which is both observable and invisible, in the molecular world there is invisible things. In the, in the physical world that you and I touch, there are those things that we can see and touch. What we cannot see, what we can see, is reality. What I'm asking you to do is to adopt the understanding, to think for a moment, beyond the things that you're accustomed to. And to open up your mind and your heart to think larger, to think bigger, to let God in, to entertain the concept. You've got to allow yourself to do this. I know that into this argument you bring a lot of baggage. We all do. But will you take this challenge and will you allow yourself to think for a moment that I am going to consider God. I'm going to unlock and open up my understanding. Get off the track. Get out of the groove and expand your thinking, I am confident that as you do that, you will have to encounter the person of God.